So um, today I'm going to be talking about dynamic programming. And last time we looked at dynamic programming where we had what was called a, an alignment graph. But we want to move to a, an understanding of dynamic programming that's just based on symbols. Because when you're writing a computer program, that program is symbols, things you have to write out in statements, uh, and you can't give a picture to a computer like a, an alignment graph. So we have to express in symbols how a computer actually should do the kinds of things we were doing uh, on the alignment graph. Okay, and we want to see through dynamic programming how to do alignment very efficiently. Um, okay, so just to back up a little bit, sequence comparison uh, is what we're concerned with now, two sequences, DNA sequences, protein sequences, and comparing two sequences, later multiple sequences, but right now we're looking at two sequences at a time, that is really at the heart of many, many tasks that are done in computational biology. I'm not going to try to enumerate all of them, you'll see more throughout the course, but uh, that is a very fundamental task. So we're discussing that uh, in and of itself. And the typical thing we want to know when we look at two sequences is how similar they are. Well, what does similar mean? We're going to have to be very precise about what it means for two sequences to be similar. So, of course, the, the definition that we use for similarity should have some biological meaning and that that meaning is usually comes from evolutionary similarity. So how many mutations or rearrangements, uh, insertions, deletions, various things of that type um, have caused these two sequences to differ. So those kinds of operations that are evolutionary and have caused the sequences to differ, those have got to be incorporated somehow into our notion of similarity and into the what's called the objective function that we'll use when we get a strict definition of similarity or a precise definition of similarity. So here we're going to look at a very simple definition of similarity and in order to be able to illustrate how to compute that measure, um, this particular measure of similarity only is a crude reflection of real biology and, but once we understand how to compute that measure of similarity, we'll be able to embellish it. We'll be able to make that definition more realistic for more, for richer notions of similarity that model real biology or model it better. Okay, and the computational ideas that we are going to learn today actually extend very nicely into those more complex and more realistic biological functions of similarity. So if you understand the method in the simple notion of similarity, it will not be difficult to extend the method into richer definitions of sequence similarity. So th this is, uh, now I have to define again what a, an alignment is, and, and in some ways this is a a restatement of things we've already done, but it's worthwhile making sure everybody is on the same page. So if we're given two sequences, I'll call one of them S1 and the other one S2, an alignment of S1 and S2 is obtained by inserting spaces into or before or after the ends of S1 and S2 so that the resulting two strings, S1 and S2, have the same number of characters. A space is considered as a character. Okay? Now this is actually just a review of things we've already introduced, but let's see an example. So if my S1 is the sequence there that you see in the middle of the page, and it starts T, A, C, T, etc., and S2 is A, C, A, G, etc., those two sequences are of unequal length. And we want to know how similar are those two sequences. And so, and we have not yet defined a notion of similarity. 
but we're going to do that through the notion of an alignment. So the alignment puts in spaces into S1, or before it or after it, and it also puts spaces into S2, either into it or um, in, in front of it or behind it, so that the two resulting sequences, and I'm now calling them S1 prime and S2 prime, those two resulting sequences have the same number of characters each. And you can see that uh, in the, uh, in here, uh, in here, okay? S1 prime and S2 prime have the same number of sequences, and I've, I've put them so that every character in S1 prime is opposite a single character in S2 prime. So we have now a very clear relationship between the characters of S1 prime and S2 prime. So these are the first two character, first character in S1 prime opposite the first character in S2 prime, etc. And this, for example, this A in S1 prime is opposite this T in S2 prime. Okay, so an alignment of S1 and S2 is something that's created by putting in these spaces to make the two resulting sequences the same length. And then those impose well-defined positions and therefore um, we can talk about aligned pairs of characters from S1 and S2, or S1 prime and S2 prime. So if we have two sequences, S1 and S2, <clears throat> and we have an alignment of those, then um, we can talk about pairs that are pairs of, of characters that are aligned uh, that are actually identical. So in this particular alignment of S denoted S1 prime and S2 prime, we have different we have positions where the characters are identical, for example, the CC. All right? And we have we have positions where a character is opposite a space there for example, and we have positions where uh, two characters opposite each other are different. Um, here one, A and T. Okay, so uh, in this particular example we have nine pairs that have identical characters. And you might notice that I've never put a space opposite a space and we'll see that that's uh, something that was never necessary to do. So one possible measure of similarity of two sequences is to uh, is obtained by finding an alignment that maximizes the number of aligned but not spaced characters that are identical. That is, characters that are opposite each other in the alignment that are identical. So let's go back to here for a minute. When we, we see at the end uh, of S1 and prime and S2 prime, we have C opposite C. Those are identical. And that sort of emphasizes uh, some notion that these two sequences are similar to each other. On the other hand, here we have A opposite T, and that is a kind of a reflection of the two sequences not being similar. And then we have T opposite a space, and again, that's contributes to the notion of the sequences not being similar. So if you have an alignment where you get a lot of identical characters aligning each other, a very high pro proportion of the string, or the two strings, then that's a kind of a statement that says these two sequences really are quite similar. Imagine, for example, you had two absolutely identical sequences. Well, you don't have to put any spaces in them, you just align the two as they're given, and they're all identities. And so, of course, that's a very highly um, similar pair of sequences. On the other hand, the other extreme, if let's say you had one sequence that was written just with ACs, and the other sequence which was TGs, no matter how you put spaces in, you're never going to get any identities. We don't count a space against a space as, a, as an identity. And so you'll get a very large um, number of characters that are not identical, characters against each other, the way I should have put it, will get a very small number of identical uh, characters, aligned characters, in fact zero small number, and that will reflect the fact that those two sequences are very dissimilar. All right. 
So the number of positions or characters that are identical in an alignment is taken as a measure of the similarity of the two sequences. And we want that alignment that maximizes the number of aligned characters that are identical. That is, if you have two sequences that are intuitively very, look very similar, then we ought to be able to find an alignment where the number of aligned characters that are identical is very large, or a very large percentage of the sequences, sequence length. And um, even if, that's even if we have to put in a couple of spaces here and there in order to make those uh, identical characters line up. All right, so we take the number of identical characters that result from an alignment and the alignment that maximizes that number is called the optimal alignment. The alignment with the number of, with the maximum number of identical aligned characters is called an optimal alignment of those two sequences. So that's what we want to get. We want to get an optimal alignment of those two sequences. It maximizes the number of identical characters that are aligned with each other. And then we look at what that number is as a percentage of, of, uh, of the sequence lengths um, or percentage of what's the maximum you might uh, possibly get uh, for, your, for your value and you see whether that number you're actually getting is a large percentage or a small percentage of uh, the possible. And that gives you your notion of similarity, a precise um, quantitative definition of similarity. Whether it's relevant, whether it captures the right biology is something uh, that you can still debate or investigate with particular sequences, but at least we have a very clear, precise criteria. Okay, so this just says this is a simple, very crude model of biological similarity in two sequences. A richer model would better reflect the evolutionary history causing the divergence of the sequences. And the criteria or the objective function that tries to maximize the number of identical aligned characters and the number, number of identical characters opposite each other in alignment, that particular alignment is called a maximum common subsequence. Okay. Um, so how can we compute what I'm calling an optimal alignment or a maximum common subsequence? How can we compute that efficiently? We're given two sequences. We have to find a, an alignment of those two sequences which maximizes the number of identical uh, pairs of characters uh, in, the, in, uh, in the alignment. How do you do that? The definition of alignment lets you put in spaces uh, anywhere you like. Um, if we just do this exhaustively, if we write a program somehow that tries out all possible ways of putting in spaces, would that be efficient? Would that be practical on the lengths sequences that we're interested in? Okay, so um, you have to ask, well, if we did put in spaces uh, exhaustively, tried all different possible ways, how many, uh, how many alignments would there be? Now, if we didn't, if we did allow a space to be opposite another space, then actually there's an infinite number of alignments because you can put space opposite space and make the alignment as big as you like. So then the question of how many alignments there are, uh, the answer would be an infinite num number. And so if, you, if your approach, your algorithm, was to look at all possible alignments, well, you'd never even finish. But we are not interested in having a space opposite a space because that doesn't illustrate uh, or reflect the actual similarities of the given sequences. So when we don't allow a space opposite a space, the number of alignments is finite. I'm not going to work out the actual number of them based on the two, uh, uh, the lengths of the two sequences, but we could do that and then we'll realize uh, that that number, we'll see what 
that number is, we would see if we did it, but we're not going to do that. Edit that out. Okay, so if we don't allow a space opposite a space, then the number of uh, alignments between two sequences is not going to be infinite. It's just going to be some finite number. And later we might work out what that number is, but we won't be doing that right now. Still, it has been worked out, uh, and this table shows that. So if we could enumerate, that is, create, and examine one billion, uh, billion alignments per second, so I say we, uh, we can enumerate and evaluate one billion alignments per second, here's how much time would, would, we would need based on the lengths of the two sequences. Now, actually, this table assumes that the two sequences are equal length, okay? And therefore, uh, if you think about it, you'll realize you're going to put in the same number of spaces into each of the two sequences. Maybe it's zero, in which case you just have the two sequences lined up as they were given, or maybe you put 10 into one, then in order to get the same length in the second one, you'll have to put 10 in the other ones. All right. So when the sequences both have length 30, according to this table, there are 10 to the 20 power 22. That's 10 with 22 zeros after it. All right? That, that's how many alignments there are. It's a very large number. And if you could evaluate 1 billion alignments per second, your computer zips through and looks at a billion alignments per second, that will take 10 to the 13th seconds which is 10 to the 6th years, a million years, okay? Uh, that's a long time to wait for your result. But if the sequence lengths are 50, it's even worse. Then the number of alignments is 1.5 times 10 to the 37, which is 10, and if you can do a billion of those per second, that is 10 to the 6th per second. Well, 10 to the 6th is only a million. A billion is 10 to the 9th. If you could do... Uh, a billion, if you could evaluate a billion per second, it would take you 10 to the 28th seconds, which is 10 to the 19th years, which according to this table is 10 to the 9th ages of the universe. I, I don't know how anybody knows what the age of the universe is, but apparently here we're taking it to be 10 to the 10th. Okay, well, whether we know the age of the universe or not, you can see that 10 to the 19th years is more than you'll want to wait. Uh, for aligning two sequences. And if you go up to, to uh, length 300, this is again, this is, this is if we were to enumerate every uh, possible alignment in order to evaluate it, here it says we would take 10 to the 213th years, which is 10 to the 203rd ages of the universe. Okay, so brute force enumeration, that's what this is typically called, brute force enumeration, trying everything is not a practical approach to finding the best or the optimal alignment, the alignment that maximizes the number of aligned pairs of characters that are identical. So we need some other approach. We need some other method. And the method we're going to develop is called dynamic programming. Okay? And in order to develop this approach, we think recursively. That's the general approach that gets us to the dynamic program. And recursive thinking means that we describe the problem we're trying to solve in terms of smaller instances of the same problem. So we have an instance of the same of a problem, let's say two sequences of length 30, and we want to describe how we're going to find the optimal alignment, and we describe how we find the optimal alignment in terms of smaller instances of the alignment problem. So if our original instance was length 30, then we'll talk about instances of length 29, or perhaps even less, uh, all the way down to an instance where each uh, sequence, let's say, has length 1. And then, of course, it's, it's clear what you do. If two sequences of length 1, that means each, each sequence is just a single character, and uh, since we're looking for the longest, uh, we're looking to, to maximize the number of identical aligned characters, 
the answer is either is one if the two are the same or it's zero if the two are different. All right, but thinking recursively, how do we express the logic of what we want to do? So <clears throat> when you think recursively, it actually is very useful to start out by making some notation. It's just writing symbols that are going to convey what you're thinking about, what you're trying to say. So for a string s, if we're given a string s, we're going to define sk as the characters, uh, as the character at position k, all right, and s1 through k as the prefix of s consisting of the first k characters of s. Prefix, that's the portion of s that comes at the beginning. So if this is s, then, and this is position 1, 2, 3, whoops, 4, etc., let's say up to 10, what is in here, that's the prefix of s of length 4. And we're, in notation, we're going to write that as s1 dot dot 4. Or more generally, more generally, it's s1 through k if the prefix goes out to position k. All right, well, then we can define what we want to talk about, most want to talk about, which is the maximum number of identical aligned characters. But we're going to do this in a, as I mentioned, in a smaller instance of the problem. So we define vij as the maximum number of identical aligned characters in any, in the best, alignment of substrings that takes the first i characters of S1 and the first j characters of S2. Those are the prefix of S1 of length i and the prefix of, of uh, string 2, S2, of length j. And we're saying if we look at those two prefixes, what is the maximum number of identical aligned characters that we can obtain in any possible alignment of just those two substrings. So what we're seeing here now is the two prefixes before they're aligned, because how do we know that? That's because the two have different lengths. After they are aligned, they'll have the same length. But if we define Vij, to be the maximum number of identical aligned characters over any possible alignment of substrings consisting of, of the first i characters of S1 and the first j characters of S2, then in terms of that notation, what is it that we're ultimately after? What is it we're seeking? We ultimately want VNM. We want that number. That number will tell us what's the maximum number of identical characters we could have in any alignment of all of S1, that goes out to length n, and all of, of S2, which goes out to length m. So just in terms of notation, this is what we're after. And of course, we also want to know what the actual alignment is that would give us that number. But in the, the measure of similarity between S1 and S2 will be this. And so this is the measure of similarity of S1 and S2, where we've defined similarity as the number of identical aligned characters in the best possible alignment, the alignment that maximizes that number. So this is just a formal way uh, in terms of what we've defined here of stating what similarity is. 
Okay? Now, again, we're trying to figure out how we're going to compute it. So, thinking recursively, we want to express what is Vij in terms of some values of i and j, or values of, of those two, the two parameters that are there that are smaller than i and j. So we focus on the characters, uh, character i of S1 and the character j of S2, and we ask, how are they going to be aligned relative to each other? Okay, where do they appear in the optimal alignment? I'll call it A, of S1, of the first I characters of S1, and the first J characters of S2. That is, there is some alignment of the first I characters of S1 and the first J characters of S2 that's optimal, that maximizes the number of identical aligned characters. And in that optimal alignment, A, Character, the original character I of S1 appears somewhere, and the original character J of S2 uh, appears somewhere. And there are only three possible situations or cases uh, talking about the relative positions of those two characters. It could be that the ith character of S1 and the jth character of S2 align opposite each other. They align uh, to each other, okay? So S1 of I in the alignment would be opposite S2 of J in the optimal alignment A. That's one possibility. Now, I don't, I'm not saying whether those two characters are identical or not identical. I'm just talking about where they are in the optimal alignment. And remember in the optimal alignment or in any alignment, we've put in spaces into the original sequences S1 and S2, all right? So, case two is that character S1i might appear to the left somewhere of S2j. So in the sequence, in the alignment, you end up with S1i somewhere to the left of S2j. Okay, uh, that's certainly a possibility. Uh, um, and then what it would mean is that all of these would have to be spaces because in the end, the two uh, modified sequences, the sequences after we put in spaces, uh, have to be the same length. So if S2J, that's the end of the prefix of length J, extends to the right, of S1i, which is the end of the prefix of S1 ending a character i, then um, the, the, the difference, the gap there, has got to be filled in with spaces. Okay? Well, that case too has a symmetric uh, opposite case, which is where S1i appears to the right. of S2J in the optimal alignment. Let me just actually, let's, that makes it look a little bit better. Um, and then these would have to be spaces, okay? And that's all we have. That's, those are the only three cases. In all possible alignments of S1 out to the first ith character and S2 out to the first jth character, all possible alignments are either uh, one of these are one of these three cases. Okay. All right. So now this picture shows, without individual characters there, it shows um, the first case uh, where we have character I of S1 aligning opposite character J of S2, and um, the other positions are just uh, indicated there by these little dashes. The dashes don't necessarily mean spaces. It, don't, it doesn't mean where we've put in spaces into the alignment. 
these dashes here just means I haven't shown you what the characters are there. Uh, they're original, either original characters from S1 or, and S2, or um, their spaces that we've put into there. Okay, so if we have, when, when we have this first case in detail, when we have character I opposite character J, those two are either the same, identical, or they're not. All right, if they're identical, remember we're in the objective function, we're trying to maximize the number of identical aligned characters. So if this is our alignment, then we would have Vij, that's the value you get, the best possible value you get from aligning uh, the first i characters of S1 with the first j characters of S2. That value will be 1, which we're getting from the fact that those two characters are aligned opposite each other and that they're identical, plus something else. Well, what's that something else? That something else is whatever you get from this portion, okay? From that portion of the alignment. That's if they're identical. So, we, I can't tell you what that amount is right now. I can't tell you what this is, okay? Not while I'm writing out the recurrences, not because that depends on the particular S1 and S2, but I can describe it, I can name it, I can explain it, even if I don't know the specific number it's going to be. But when we actually run this recursive uh, approach, let the, let the computer do it, then at execution time, we'll get the value. But right now, all I want to do is to name what will be added. Okay, and what will be added is v i minus one comma j minus one. It's the value, the maximum number of aligned pairs that you will get in any possible alignment of the first i minus one characters of S1 with the first j minus one characters of S2. Because we're saying we're in the case where the alignment of the first i characters of S1 and the first j characters of S2, we're in the case where that alignment puts those two opposite each other. And so what's left over is an alignment of the first j minus 1 characters of S1 and the first j minus 1 characters of S2. And we can align those in any way we like in order to maximize the number of identical matches, identical uh, pairs that we see in that alignment, okay? So we know how to name what's in that double question mark. We don't know what its value is because that, de that will depend on, the, uh, on the, what the two sequences are, but we know how to name what that is, okay? So what we have is that the value of Vij or Vij will be equal to 1. Remember, we're, we're on the assumption that, well, that these two characters are actually the same. It will be 1 plus whatever you're going to get, whatever is possible to get from the first i minus 1 characters of S1 and the first j minus 1 characters of S2. So even though we don't know what that v i minus 1, j minus 1 will be, we can write it down. So we get, in, in the case when S1 i is equal to S2 j, then the value of v i j is equal to 1 because of this alignment and because of this equality, plus v i minus 1, j minus 1. Okay, so what if we align those two characters i and j, but they're not identical? Then what is v i j equal to? We again look at this as double question mark, and again we don't know what that specific number is going to be until we look at the actual strings or sequences S1 and S2. But we can name it. We can write down the logic of it. Okay. So we now we're we're talking about S1 i is aligned opposite S2 j, but they're not equal. 
Whatever this character is, is different than the other character. So you don't get the one, which would reflect two identical aligned characters, because they're not identical. Nonetheless, you do get this, because that's what you can get from the alignment of those characters to the left. And so whatever is feasible in that alignment is what you will get overall for VIJ. So to recap, when characters S1i aligns with S2j, then VIJ, the value of the best possible alignment of just the first i characters in S1 and just the first j characters in S2, that best possible alignment has a value of 1 plus vi minus 1 comma j minus 1 if it happens that those two characters i and j are actually identical. But it only gets a value of v i minus 1 j minus 1 without the 1 if they happen to be different. Okay? So this is a recursive thinking. Here we have i j, here we have i minus 1 j minus 1. They're smaller. The values in here are smaller. We're describing an instance of a problem that has a parameter i and a parameter j in terms of an instance that's smaller in terms of those two parameters. Okay? Now, we can look at case 2 and case 3. All right? So, what happens when S1i is to the left of S2j? Okay? Well, then I, I said before, S2j has to be opposite of space. So here we're saying um, S1i is somewhere to the left in this alignment. All we know is it's to somewhere to the left of S2j. Okay. Um, and so um, in that case, S2j is going to be opposite of space, all right? And then we don't know what's going on here. But we have a name for it. We have a name for the value you're going to get out of it. Well, first of all, the S2j opposite of space is, is not going to give you a 1, because you only get a 1 when you align two identical characters. And... Uh, S2j is not a space because we don't have space opposite space, and space wasn't a part of the original S1's, S2 string. So this portion of the alignment is going to give us zero. All right. So the total value of the alignment Vij, when we're in this subcase, we're in the case where S1i appears to the left of S2j, the total value of Vij is just going to be Vi j minus 1. We have all of the characters of S1 out to i, so that's why this is an i, but we only have the first j minus 1 characters of S2, because it goes to here, the jth character is assumed to be opposite of space. So the total value you'll get for this subcase of vij is just vi j minus 1. And symmetrically, if we have the opposite case, where the ith character of S1 appears to the right of the jth character of S2, then the value of Vij is going to be Vi minus 1j. And the, the logic for this is exactly the same as what I did in, uh, up here, and you should uh, convince yourself that that is true. So now we can collect all of these three cases. And that's called, when we do that, we put it together, it's called a general recurrence. So the general recurrence tells you what Vij is in terms of V of smaller parameters, smaller than i and j. So we have these cases, and Vij equals the best, the maximum, I'll write it out here again, max, well, it's equal the maximum of these three cases. Or actually, it's four cases, the way I've written it down here. It's 1 plus 
vi minus 1, j minus 1, and that happens when s1i is equal to s2j, and we align character i with character j. That's possible to do. We can enforce aligning character i with character j, and if they're equal, then we get this amount. On the other hand, if we align character i and character j, and they're not equal, they're not identical characters, then we'll only get this amount. This is the amount you can, the best you can get when you use the first i minus 1 characters of S1 and the first j minus 1 characters of S2. On the other hand, in the other two cases, case 2 and case 3, okay, so these are the three possibilities because about 10 minutes ago I said there are only three possible alignments of the first i characters of S1 and the first j characters of S2. Those three possible alignments, or three types of alignments, actually the number of alignments is huge, but the three types of alignments are when you have character i opposite character j, or when you have character i to the left of character j, or we have character j to the left of character i. Okay, those are the three types, and here what we have are all the cases that explain what vij will be in those three different situations. Or here, the first situation where i is opposite j is broken into two possible subcases. Uh, either character i is the same as character j, or character i is different than character j. So this is a what's called general recurrences that explain what vij is in terms of this notation of v with smaller parameters than i and j. It's laying out the logic without actually telling you how we're going to do the computation efficiently or telling you what the actual numbers will be because you won't know those numbers until you look at the specific uh, strings, S1 and S2. But it's, nonetheless, it's a way of expressing the logic. Okay, now when we describe these general recurrences, it's, it's how vij relates to v of two smaller parameters. Well, when does this ever stop? It stops when one of those parameters is zero. Okay, so vi, that's called a base case. vi zero is equal to v zero j is equal to zero for any i and j. That is, if you have i characters of S1, and you're aligning them to no characters of S2, how many, over the all possible alignments, how many identical characters are you going to get in that alignment? Well, zero, because S2 has no characters, okay? And similarly, V0J is going to be zero as well. So uh, those are called the base cases, that is, uh, when we get down to parameters here and here, where one of them is zero, then we actually know what its value is. We're not expressing it recursively anymore. We're expressing it as an actual number, in this case, zero. Okay, so now we have the correct recurrences that express what vij is in terms of smaller problem instances. And we could write those up in a program, a program that has some recur recursion, the ability to do recursion. So if you know computer programming, and if you, use, you, if you have used a language such as, say, Python or C or C++ that allows recursion, then you could just easily program this up. And then what we really want is VNM, and N is the length of S1 and M is the length of F S2. And you would just call VNM, and the computer would do all the recursion to compute, using the recurrence relations, what the value of VNM is. So VNM, when you try to compute VNM, that recursive program would make a call to VN minus 1, M minus 1, for example, uh, because that's here, 
when we're looking for the max of these possibilities, this one says I need to know what v i minus 1 uh, comma j minus 1 is. All right, so if you called, if you just implemented this, these recurrences into a recursive program and then called v and m, so v and m would want to compute v n minus 1 m minus 1, because that's what this, these two say you need to do. And it would also want to know what v n m minus 1 is, and it will also want to know what v n minus 1 m is. That corresponds to these two cases. So that recursive program will generate all of these recursive calls. This computation will generate more calls and so on. And if you work it out, if you take a class like Computer Science 122 in our curriculum, you would do the analysis and you would realize that this is not a very efficient approach either. And the reason is that in that those successive recursive calls of the program, we would end up calling the same value for the same computation, for the same values, many times. So let's say n was equal to 10 and m is equal to um, 15. So in those recursive calls, ultimately, somewhere in there you would want to get, for example, um, v86. Uh, and if you work it out, just walk through all the recursive calls, you'll see that v86 is being called for many, many, many times. And we could be more precise about that. But those are called re redundant recursive calls. And that's why this top-down approach of just implementing the recurrence relations in a recursive programming language and then calling VNM, which then in, in its execution calls all the smaller ones and smaller ones and so on, uh, that would be very, very redundant and very expensive. So, so, so far we've not answered the question of how we're going to compute VNM efficiently. We've just, we've seen if we explicitly enumerate all possible alignments, that's not efficient. We now have a recursive understanding of what VNM is in terms of smaller values uh, for V with smaller parameter values. But if we just implement that understanding as a top-down program, that's also not efficient. So what do we do? In dynamic programming, almost always the trick is to reverse your perspective. You can get to this point of having the recursive understanding, which could give you a top-down execution, but you don't do a top-down execution. Instead, you do what's called a bottom-up execution. So we don't make explicit recursive calls to determine v values, but we only do lookups for previously computed v values. And instead of starting with v and m, which is what we ultimately want to compute, instead of starting with a call to v and m, to find the value of v and m, what we do is we compute the base cases first, and then from there we compute the values for parameters that get a little bit larger and a little bit larger until finally at the end we have v and m. So let's see exactly how this is done. So we start by computing the base cases. Well, the base cases were, were set out explicitly. We know what the base values are. VI0 and V0J are the same and they're both equal to zero. So we know that, okay? Then after you've computed VI0 and V0J, and I'm gonna put this into a table of what we already know. Okay, so there's a table V, V, and this is going to be, um, this is gonna be for the I and this is gonna be for the J. Yeah, having a hard time writing that J. Come on. That's for the J. And we're saying that we, for any I, if J is equal to zero, we know what that value is going to be. It's going to be zeros everywhere in here. 
Okay? And we're also saying that when i is equal to zero, for any j, we know what those values are going to be. They're going to be zero. So in this table, this is a table of v, value v i j will be right there at row i and column j. Okay. So when j is equal to zero, we get zeros everywhere. And when i is equal to zero, we get zeros everywhere. So these, these column numbers begin with zero, okay, and then um, and the row numbers begin with zero, and then we go to n, and out here to m, okay? So let me get a little, clean up this a little bit, get rid of that guy. All right. So we're trying to fill in this table by using the recurrences, and we're going to do it in an efficient way. And ultimately, what do we want? Ultimately, we want the value that's going to be here. So we're starting with values that are pretty far away from that. That is, we know those guys, and we know those guys, uh, and we ultimately want to know what this one is. All right. Well, let's look at this next position here. Okay, so now we're asking what is V11? Because that's row 1, column 1. So what is V11? Well, we don't know what it is, but the recurrences express what V11 is in terms of V with smaller parameters than 1 and 1. Okay, let's just... Um, those general recurrences for v i j, and now we're looking at one one. Those require that we have v i minus one. Well, i is one, so that's going to be a zero, and j minus one. So we'll need v zero zero. Well, where is v zero zero? It's right there. It's zero. We'll also need v i minus one j, which means we need v. Um, 0, 1, and we'll need V1, 0. But V0, 1 is right here, it's 0. V1, 0 is right there, it's 0. So in terms of the recurrence relations, we already have available the values we need. What else do we need to know? We need to know whether character 1 of S1 is equal to character 1 of S2 or not. Again, let's go back to the recurrences. Uh, in these recurrences, you see you need V I minus 1, J minus 1, but you also need to know whether the characters at position 1, at position I of one string S1 is equal to uh, position the character position J of, S, of S2. Uh, and in, in the moment, we're talking about i and j equal to 1. So are those two characters identical, or are they not identical? That's what we need to know in order to fill in the value here. But of course, we have the strings available to us. We know what S1 and S2 are. So uh, looking to see whether those two characters are identical is some, something we can certainly do very efficiently. So I'm just trying to say that we can compute the value of of V11 efficiently. We know what the values of the three values of, around it are, which are what's called for by the recurrence relation. We, we can find out whether uh, the character at position 1 of S1 is the same or not of the character at position 1 of S2. And therefore, we can try out the, the different cases in the recurrence relation and see which one gives you the biggest number. In here, it's going to be either 0 or 1, right? Okay, so after we have computed V11, if you look at the recurrences, you'll see that we have everything we now need in order to compute the value V12 or V21. So let's go back to this little table. So I've just computed this value. 
let's say I've, I've computed that value. Now, of course, in, in order to actually compute a, a number there, I, know, I need to know what S1 is and what S2 is, okay? Or in particular, what is the uh, character at the first position of S1 and the character at the first position of S2. Whereas here, I'm just telling you the, the logic of it. But the point is that if you now know what this value is, you're all set to compute what that value is. And you're also all set to compute what that value is. Because you look back at the recurrences, the recurrences require that you know, let's say I want to compute that one, position two. Boy, it's hard to write with this. Position two. You know what, this, what character is a position two of, of string S2, and you know what character is a position one of S1, so you know whether or not those two are identical. And the recurrences say that what you need is this value, this value, and this value, okay? You need the I minus one, J minus one, you need the I, J minus one, and you need the I minus one, J. So you have all the values you need in order to figure out what that, what that number should be. And once you do that, you have everything you need to fill in this one. And if you'd filled in this one, you have everything you need to fill in that one, and so on. Okay, so after we fill in V11, and then we fill in value V12, and then we fill in value V21, we see that we can set all the values V1J for in increasing values of j, that is we can go across the first row filling in the values, or we could go down the first column, or column number one, column number, uh, is it row number one, or column number one. There's also a row zero and column zero, okay? So when I say first row and first column, I'm talking about column number one and row number one. Okay, so we can fill in that first, the row number one, or fill in the column number one. And after you do that, you'll realize same logic. So let's say we've we filled in row zero. We know those are all zeros. And we filled in column zero. We know those are all zeros. And now let's say we fill in row one, which we will do from left to right. Because this, with this, one, this value can be filled in using um, those three values. When I write, oh, these guys look like zeros. I didn't mean to say that they're all zeros, just that they are, so think of them as squares. I'm filling in those squares. And I can fill them in left to right, left to right in row one. I can't do it right to left, because out here, I don't have what I need in terms of the recurrence relations. The recurrence relations say that what you need for this one are the three surrounding values to the up, up and to the left, and you need to know what these two characters are. Well, we know what the two characters are, but until I, uh, and I actually do know what this is, and I know what this is, but I don't know what this one is. I won't know that one until I go out, get out to that point, filling in left to right. But if we do fill in left to right, then we'll get that value. So we'll have all the values for the first row, and we can go on to the second row, and so on. And that's called filling in the table. This is the dynamic programming table. Filling it in row-wise, one row after another. But we can also fill it in column-wise, going through the column one, and then column two, and column three. But either way, we're filling in this table and ultimately getting down to V and M. And when, we when we've reached here, we know what that number is in there. That tells us the V and M value which, we tried to be, which we're trying to compute. That is the dynamic programming approach to computing V and M, and V and M is our notion of similarity. Okay, so it's bottom up in the sense that we're computing the values for small parameters going up to larger parameters. When we created the recurrences, we thought 
the other direction. We thought, what is Vij in terms of V of smaller parameters, I minus 1, J minus 1, etc. But when we actually do the computation, the dynamic programming computation, we go in the other order, from smallest to largest, but we use the logic of the recurrence relations. We use the recurrence relations at every step. Every time we're trying to fill in a value of a, of a cell in the dynamic programming table, we use the recurrence relations that we developed earlier. Okay, so I hope it's clear that this approach works. That is, it, it computes VNM. The recurrence relations we developed made sense, hopefully, in terms of uh, the logic of this value V. And hopefully it made sense how we're filling in this table and how it's possible to fill in the table. So we will, in this way, compute VNM. But is this efficient? Is this any better than what the two approaches I told you already are not good ones? Is it any better than just trying to all put in all the spaces to try all possible alignments? Or is it any better than using the recurrence relations top down, which I also said is not good because of the redundant recursions? So we want to analyze how many operations are done when we do this computation in this way, in what I'm calling the dynamic programming way. Okay, well, to, to answer that question, we first say, well, how many values of that table V do we need to determine? Okay, well, the table V, it has 0 through n rows, and it has 0 through m columns. Okay, so it has n plus 1, times m plus 1 cells. Here's a particular cell, i, j. Okay, so it has that many cells. And so we're going to have to fill in that many cells. Now, let's say we do it row-wise, which we said we could do. Well, first of all, we, we always fill in the base case. How many operations are that? Well, that's just m plus 1 operations filling in these values, because we know they're all going to be 0, and n plus 1 this way. So initially we did m plus, m plus n plus 2 operations. m plus m plus 2. Okay? That's to start out. And then if we fill in the table row-wise, which we said we could do, we're going to go this row 1 and then row 2, and row 3, etc. Whenever you're looking at a particular cell, what do you have to do? According to the recurrences, you have to figure out what these two characters are, a position i and position, sorry, position j and position i. Well, that's just looking into the two strings. Call that two operations. You have to compare whether or not they're, determine whether or not they're identical or not. That's one operation. And then you have to look up, according to the recurrences, you need to know what the value is in this cell, this cell, and this cell. Those are the three adjoining cells to the up, upper and left of the cell you're presently trying to fill in. So that means three lookups. And then you have to do some additions and some comparisons. Altogether, if I were to add up all those little operations, the number of those operations I just said, I should have paid attention to exactly how many there are, and as a homework you can do that, but it's, let's just say, less than, I don't know, 15 operations per cell. Okay? So, if it requires, in order to fill in this table, at most 15 operations per cell, then what's the total number of operations in order to fill in the table and to get the value we want? Well, it's 15 times the number of cells. So it's 15 times n plus 1 times m plus 1. Okay? So that's about 15 
N M about. Okay? I'm just dropping the plus ones. N times M is vastly, vastly, vastly smaller than the number of alignments of two sequences of length N and M. It's vastly smaller than the number of um, recursive calls that would be called if we did the top-down computation. N times M is a reasonable number. Let's take N and M to be equal and both, let's say, length a thousand. What is a thousand times a thousand? Okay, anybody know here? It's a million, right? So two sequences of length a thousand is a million. Well, how many operations per second does a typical modern computer, current computer do? Well, the operations that a current computer does are, are less than the kinds of operations, more primitive than the kind of operations we're doing here. But as off the top of my head, you can, a typical modern computer could do 15, a, a, a million, sorry, a million additions per second, or a million comparisons per second, or even faster. I, you know, I'm showing my obsolescence here in not knowing. But for n equal to m equal to a thousand, this approach to filling in the table and to getting this value on a modern computer will take a second or less than a second or maybe a little bit more than a second. Okay, It will be practical. It will be efficient. n times m grows in a way as a function of n and m that is practical and vastly, vastly smaller than the number of ways of alignments, number of alignments there are. Even though we didn't work that out explicitly, I can tell you uh, that that's true. N times M is practical in relation to the number of alignments. And it's also practical, vastly, vastly smaller than the number uh, of recursive calls you would do in a top-down recursion. Even though we haven't done that analysis, that is true. So we grow the time, the number of operations, as a function of the length of the strings grows roughly as the product of those, uh, of those two lengths. Now, if we want to actually determine what the optimal alignment is, and not just the value, not just V and M, but I want to know where actually do I put those spaces so that the, I get the optimal alignment. That's something in dynamic programming that's called, that we get through something that's called the traceback. And we'll talk about that later. But today what we did is we, we defined the similarity of two sequences with a fairly simple notion of similarity, where we're just maximum, we an alignment that maximizes the number of identical characters that are aligned opposite each other. We have defined that and We've shown how to compute it in time or number of operations that is proportional to n times m. And that is a practical value for the kinds of strings that come up in sequence analysis, in um, bioinformatics. All right, that is it for today. Thank you.